as you may have seen online, I'm planning on talking about macros. Um, and what I normally do in these presentations is actually do a slide, just you know, bullet points of what they are. But I figured at this point I'd actually just show one in practice, just to sort of get an idea, because it might be a little easier to show what it does rather than see what it does. So here I've got a list of just five items, uh, obviously just made up. Um, and for what I might often want to do is change this into, for instance, HTML. So if I were just doing this normally, I'd start typing, I'd go to the bottom of the file, add some HTML tags, and then I'd sit there and say, okay, I need to um, maybe copy and paste these or just retype with li tags for each one of these things. But what I could do with a macro is I could just hit the add character and uh, another letter, and all of a sudden this just goes and replaces everything for me. This is actually slowed down just for dramatic effect. Usually macros would just do that instantly. So this is, as I said, a macro, which is essentially a way of saying, like with any other program like Microsoft Word or sometimes even video games, is just a way of recording some sequence of commands to play again later. Um, and this macro that I just played there was actually even a recursive macro, which is more or less the same thing, except that this one will call itself again until it can't be run anymore. So. I had five items and it just kept on going and going and going. If I'd had ten items, it would have gone through all ten of those. So that's really quite cool. So, you know, uh, hopefully macros are a pretty simple concept to just sort of wrap your head around, but the question is, once you know what macros are, how do you get them? <laughs> so, if you're anything like me, you may have occasionally seen this recording message at the bottom of Vim. Uh, which for a long time actually kind of freaked me out because I had no idea what was going on. Um, I would frequently just exit out of Vim because I had no idea how to get it to go away and I didn't know what it was doing, where it was recording, what, like, you know, is it sending it to the government? You know, what's <laughs> happening? So, turns out what you were doing there was actually recording a macro and the reason you might have seen it is because it's actually really easy to get started recording. In fact, even knowing that, that happens now, I sometimes do it by accident anyway, because all you have to do is you have to press Q in normal mode and then some arbitrary letter, in this particular case I'm saying E, um, and that puts you in recording mode. That's when that recording message will show up. Um, and then you can just start typing any regular commands. Um, you can go into insert mode, you can go into visual mode, you can change things around, and it will just record all of that into the macro. And once you're done recording, you go back to normal mode and you just press Q again. So if you actually didn't want to record a macro in the first place, you just want that recording message to go away. You don't have to exit in, you can just press Q. <laughs> um, so once you're uh, done recording, uh, press Q and you're done. So an example of this would be, say we've got a, f a file or a series of files where we want to replace five lines that we know are repeated in multiple places, but they are, for instance, sensitive data or something. So we want to replace them with this message to test this. This part was redacted, okay? This is not something you can see. It's not relevant, just don't worry about it. So because we don't necessarily want to have to retype all the sequence of commands and that message to you say redacted over and over again, we're just going to record a macro to it. So to get started, the first thing we press is QE. That says record macro into E. Then we run this command. C4J, which just changes the current line and four lines down, and it leaves us in insert mode, so that then we can simply type our redacted message. Um, and then we press escape, and this is back into normal mode. And we're done with recording macro, so we just press Q. And that's all there is to it, and that will wind up with this particular macro in register E. One thing to notice is that this uh, text is actually included, this escape character was actually encoded um, I don't know, with that um, caret notation. So everything, including non-printable characters that you type, um, actually gets put into the macro. So that's going to be important to, to know for later. But uh, essentially, you know, any control characters or anything like that will get coded in 
So once you've recorded these macros, uh, you will want to replay them. And that was something I briefly mentioned earlier, which is just, you know, in normal mode, you press add, and then you press the character whatever uh, macro you recorded. So if we recorded that macro into register E, we would play uh, it back by pressing at E. Um, the macro will continue to play uh, until it hits the end, or it actually will continue if, until it hits an error message. So if we only had, say, for instance, three lines in the file, uh, that macro might not have worked, might have errored out at that point because you know there wasn't, there weren't uh, five lines to change. It. Um, the thing is, once it hits that error, it will just stop. But everything it changed up until that point will um, stay in effect. And that might seem like a problem, but it's not actually. It's something that you would want to have happen. And I said the word registers a few times. And actually, that was the topic of my last talk here. So I'm not going to go into them too in depth here. But essentially, in short, uh, they're just um, some uh, memory-based text storage. It's kind of like clipboards, basically. Um, there are some that uh, behave in a sort of magical way on automatically filling up with values. Um, but the ones that we're most interested in for macros are the ones that are written into uh, manually, like the E register earlier. There's 26 of them, obviously, A through Z. But even though the, we're primarily interested in the A through Z registers for macros, you can actually play any, uh, any of the registers as macros. So if, for instance, there's this dot register, which contains the last inserted text, you could actually run at dot and so if you just typed a series of vim commands in vim for some reason into your file, uh, you could run them immediately then by pressing at dot. Um, once you've uh, recorded the macro, sometimes you might want to look back at it to see like, okay, this didn't actually do what I wanted it to do. How do I see where I went wrong? So. With the fact that these are just registers, you can actually use register commands to dump out the contents. So, you know, you would press double quote in the name of the register you want and P to paste it. So basically that puts it into the current file that you're editing so you can inspect it. Or, um, double quote EP. Um, alternately, you can use the registers command, which actually inspects the contents of all the registers. If you just say, registers with no argument, it displays every register currently active in Vim. Otherwise, you can give it the name of a specific register and it will just show you that one. That would be useful if, for instance, it's a big, huge, ugly macro and you don't want to clutter up your file with whatever the contents are, you just want to look at it. And of course, editing macros is similarly related to registers, which is to say you can just use the standard copy, paste, yank functions to um, to put the contents of uh, a file or whatever into, um, into the register for later replay. Well, one thing that is worth noting, this was actually a command to delete a line into register E, the entire line. But as I mentioned earlier, all non-printable characters are still encoded as actual values. So what you deleted there with that delete one line was the contents of the line as well as the carriage return character at the end of it. Which means that when, it, when Vim goes to replay that, it's going to press enter as the very last command that it runs. Now, in most cases, I believe the enter command is by default just mapped to move down one line, but if you've remapped it to do something incredibly complicated and destructive, then, you know, uh, you'll wind up doing something incredibly complicated and destructive without meaning to, unless you're very careful with what commands you use to load up your macro. So again, we've gotten a little back into the abstract, so I wanted to show you know, how to edit the macro. So here, we can actually even see replaying the macro a little bit. So we just pressed at E, and it just ran that for us. Now, as I mentioned earlier, that didn't, uh, it just happened instantly. In this case, it doesn't, it doesn't normally type characters one at a time for us. Um, but if you look at it, you'll we'll see, okay, we undid that because what I wanted to show is only the first three lines were actually secret. Everything else was just stuff. So, you know, we wanted to take 
this macro that we had, we want to change this 4 into a 2. Because um, we only want to delete 3 lines. We realized that we were wrong, it wasn't 5 lines, it was 3 lines. Now, this macro is short enough that we could actually just retype the macro real quick. Probably faster than it would be to edit it. But if it were longer, more complicated, uh, it might be kind of a pain to retype everything. So what we can do instead is we can actually go back and use the top of our file as a scratch space here and uh, put the contents of that macro in place by saying, okay, paste the contents of the macro. And you'll, as you'll see, they've got the escape character there. It looks like two characters, but it is just one character. Um, so now the, the macro we recorded is in the file, so we can jump back and replace that text. And then we can use this command to pull it out, uh, to put it back in the, uh, in the register. Um, so this is a slightly complicated command, but again, we just told it the register we wanted to put it into, and we said delete a big word. Now, I said this instead of delete, I um, delete the whole line because this would actually leave that carriage return character alone. So you see we still have that blank line there, which means we didn't grab that carriage return character without meaning to. So if we delete that and then, you know, run our macro again, we'll see that we only replace those three lines because, of course, the contents of the register now have just that two in place there instead of the four. So a few other things to note, and none of my examples have shown this yet very particularly clearly, but macros are what they call transactional for, I mean, I think everybody here is familiar with database concepts and everything. So that basically just means that you can roll back the entire actions of a macro with just one call to undo. So normally, when you go into insert mode and out of insert mode, that's one undo. And when you change some text somewhere else, that's a different invocation of undo. Now, if you did that all as part of a macro, and you just executed it, and it did like five different things, then if you press undo once, it'll rewind all the way back to just before you ran the macro, which is kind of cool. I honestly don't, I, it didn't occur to me until today, but I honestly don't know what happens if as part of your macro execution, you jump to a new file. Um, I don't know if it'll undo all the way back through all of the files that you've edited in that session, but yeah. Um, Another thing is you can rerun the same macro you just ran most recently by pressing at at instead of, for instance, running at e, at e, at e. You just run at e, at 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 at, at, at until, you know, the cows come home. Um, you can kind of think of the um, at as being sort of like a special macro specific register, um, but it's not exactly a register in and of itself. That doesn't mean like, okay, when you run at e, uh, it puts the contents of whatever's in register E in the at register. It actually just says the last macro that was run was run out of register E. So if you change E, if you change the contents of E after running it, and then run at at, it'll actually run whatever's currently in E. So just something to be aware of. And then there's recursive macros. Now, I stayed away from recursive macros for a while after I learned what macros in general were because I assumed they were this massively different concept. And, uh, you know, I was just nervous that like, I wouldn't understand what was going on. But it turns out they're really actually just standard macros that have an additional call to execute themselves at the very end. So, for instance, this would be how you would uh, re implement the find and replace. Uh, like search and replace in the entire file using a recursive macro. Basically, it's just a command to change whatever the current word is with this, another redaction here, escape, go to the next search result, and then start over again. So it's, you know, change the word, jump to a result, change the word, jump to a result, change the result, or jump to a result. Um, because, of course, we've got this at E invocation at the end, so that's assuming this is you know, macro, the macro in register E. Um, these, of course, will continue to run until they hit an error condition, because if every single time you hit the end, the very last thing is go to back to the beginning, there is no other way for them to end. So this is why it's actually good that when it hits an error condition, um, 
a macro will simply stop where it is and not rewind itself. Because if it didn't, then we couldn't have recursive macros. And they are actually pretty useful. Now, this is a contrived example, because of course we can search and replace in many other ways. But if it were more long and complicated, then it would be um, much more useful. Um, so there's actually a few different ways to create recursive macros. And this is the way I usually see people describe it, but it's actually not my favorite way to do it. You can start by emptying your macro register, which is to say you can record an empty macro. So when you say QEQ, you're basically saying record an empty string into the macro. Then you would record your normal macro, and then you would just press at E before uh, closing out. So you would say QE, record the macro, at E, Q. And what happens is, of course, you're replaying the empty macro um, just before you exit. And because it's empty, nothing happens. But when it goes to execute itself again later, there's, of course, um, contents at that point. So then it replays itself over and over again. I don't necessarily like this because, of course, you have to remember to empty out the register first, and you, know, you have to record the macro, and uh, remember to do that at E. I frequently forget to do that. So this is another way you can do it, and this is the way I tend to prefer to do it, because it allows me to record the macro like usual. So I'm just recording the macro, and I record it in such a way that, you know, I can just manually run it, and then run it again without doing anything else. So I can test it out a few times and make sure it works. And then, uh, rather than re-recording it as a recursive macro or anything, you can actually use the uh, up special uppercase register, which if you go back and look at the registers talk I gave, is the append version of the register. Uh, so if we put the, this at E text in the file uh, and put our cursor right here, we can use this command, which uses uh, double quote capital E 2x to delete two characters, i.e. the at E, um, and puts that at the end of the current contents of the register. And option three might even be a little bit better than that, uh, just because you don't have to put any text in your file and you know mess with your file at all. So you record the macro again, like usual, and then you use vimscript via command mode to set the contents of the variable uh, or register to whatever the contents of the register are, plus this string, which is at E at the very end. If you're familiar with Perl, which I think uh, there's at least a passing familiarity with most people. Uh, this dot command, or PHP, uh, is basically just like the append the string operator. So all we're really saying is, you know, extend this string with a little bit more. And this isn't actually nearly as cool as when Apple does it. This is just another <laughs> thing that I remembered and I couldn't figure out where to stick it in the presentation. But macros don't actually have to end in normal mode. Like every single time we've been talking about macros, they've wound up ending in normal mode because, of course, we're recording the macros with that QE process. But you saw we were able to put contents of uh, things into the macro without that, uh, without that QE command, or Q command. Um, sometimes this can actually happen as a result of an error. Because again, once the macro hits an error condition, it stops, and even in uh, insert mode, there are commands that you can run, and those commands can have errors, and of course that can dump you out into insert mode. Uh, that's pretty rare though, because um, I don't think uh, usually in command mode you're using a whole lot of advanced, or in, in macros, I don't think you're usually going to wind up using a lot of really advanced crazy stuff. But occasionally it's useful to do things like that on purpose. Um, like for instance, if you have some crazy long sequence of things that you do and you want to put a comment somewhere in the file explaining, you know, okay, this is why I did it here or something to that effect. So it's pretty rare, but it's possible. And one thing that you can do is you can use those register manipulation commands uh, to uh, build a macro that doesn't end. So here we've got our command that we ran before. And say we want to change this so that every time we change those three lines, we include a note at the very end that says, OK, this is why I redacted this spot. Because maybe it's three different lines. Maybe there's just different reasons that it's redacted in different locations. So you want to include a comment saying, like, OK, this one had personal information. This one you're just not authorized to see, so on and so forth. 
So we want to get rid of this escape character. Now, of course, we can't just report it by saying QE and running the thing and then just typing Q at the end without hitting escape first, because of course the Q will wind up just being typed literally. It's not going to cancel the recording mode. So that won't work. Just supposed to go away. Um, so what we can do instead is we can put the contents of the register into the file, and then we can put our cursor right here. We can run this command here, which takes, okay, says go into register E and take everything up to the second uh, angle bracket. So it takes everything except this escape character, and so then the contents of the register are, of course, what we wanted, so that then we run this macro and wind up with this text written, and we can just continue typing after running the macro, which is pretty handy. And I figured, at this point, I just kind of half wanted to show off a little bit, just because I thought this was really cool and fun to do, and it took me a while. Um, but I also wanted to show some examples that just weren't contrived, like a, a real-world example of a fairly complicated macro. So this was one where I had to take a whole bunch of HTML, I had to take some uh, from a very old project, and move a whole bunch of it into um, some JavaScript calls. Like I had to take some values from various attributes and pile them together into a whole bunch of different JavaScript calls. And I had to do this over about 200 different iterations of this. Now if I had to do this by hand, and this was the most efficient way I could think of to do it, so I sat there and I planned this out. If I were doing this by hand, it would have been way more keystrokes, and I would have had to do it 100 or 200 times. And if you can imagine, if I had to do this by hand 200 times, uh, you know, I would have invariably made well, just at least one mistake. <laughs> and of course, that would have been a pain. It also would have taken me days probably, in a very tedious process. Whereas with this, I could simply run at W, and it jumps through all the hoops of doing everything for me. And this one actually did take, like, usually it's instantaneous. This actually took a minute or two to run. I, like, went and made myself some coffee. <laughs> but, you know, it did take a little bit of thinking. Like, I actually busted out the whiteboard and sat there and wrote things out and moved things around until I got it right. But, you know, this was about 20 to 30 minutes worth of work and then two minutes to run it, whereas it would have taken me two days, three days of tedium, and it just would have been awesome. So I really think the macros are a very useful tool. It's not just, you know, random stupid examples that I can think of, but that's actually really, uh, you know, useful stuff. So, are there any questions? I was wondering about the, um, like the at at. So it sounds like that set <laughs> At is like a pointer or a link to whatever the last mm -hmm. macro that was run. Could you just, instead of saying like, you know, record into E and then at the end save E for your recursive, could you s just do the at 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 the end, which would automatically, or do you run into issues if it's something else, is, if some other macro happened to run? Like if you were. I, I think the biggest problem with that is, I mean, I, I actually, I, I get what you're saying with that. I think the biggest problem with that is it will run whatever the last time a macro was run. So unless that other macro also happened to be empty at the time. So if you, for instance, last time you ran a macro, you ran at A or something, uh, and you tried to record a recursive macro into at E, um, if you, um, ran that and then press add add as the very last command instead of add e, then you'd run whatever was in a again. Which I didn't, I should have mentioned this in the talk, but like when you're recording these macros, you are working on an actual file. So it's not just like, you know, you're recording these in a void and as soon as you're done recording, it stops uh, and rewinds or anything. You're actually editing the file uh, when the first time you record it. So if you do that add add thing and it does something, from a different macro. Good Plus, job. I'm also not entirely sure because I've never tried it. If um, if the at at is aware of the it counts counts the macro you just executed and is still in the process of executing as having completed and goes back to that. I'm honestly not sure. Worth uh, checking out at some point. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I don't I don't know if that's 
So when you write the register, right, like like at E, does that save forever or is it just for your current session? Um, if you have the Vim info file stuff turned on, which by default, if you're in no compatible mode, which I think uh, is the default behavior, if you execute it with like actually typing Vim or if you have a .vimrc file in place, like that's the default behavior, I think, is to set no compatible at that point. Uh, and you can more you can explicitly turn off the Vim info file, but if you don't, then that saves whatever the um, contents of all the registers are in a file named dot info uh, dot Vim info in your home directory. Um, so those will actually persist between sessions. So if you wanted to use like at a in one file, and then like a couple days later, you wanted to use it somewhere else. You you actually forgot you had made at a, and you went to make you went to name your new register your, your new macro you were making at a. Would it overwrite it? Would it prompt? Uh, it would just overwrite it. It's not going to prompt you. Okay. Um, but you could use it if you didn't overwrite it. You could use it several days later potentially. See. Any other questions or anything? No. Oh, very good, though. I, I think I recorded a simple macro before, but it's, it, you know, anytime I needed to make a change, it was, you know, redo the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of cool learning about the um, being able to sort of edit it. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, definitely quite handy to be able to just sort of go through and, and grab that. Right. So, um, one last thing before I'm done. I actually am wearing a DCVPW shirt. Um, I'm going to give a little plug because I'm sort of helping organize DCVPWs with the DC Baltimore Pro Workshop, and they have a call for proposals that's open right now. And it would be, you know, if you're interested in Perl, uh, you can certainly just come to the conference. If you're really interested in Perl, you know, feel free to give it, submit, a, submit a talk for potentially a Where's that going to be held? Um, it's going to be in the um, University of Baltimore. University of Baltimore. Oh, okay. Civil Business Center. Yeah, so it's like down near Penn Station. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. So it's pretty convenient, and uh, it's really nice. We actually had it there. We alternate between going going between Baltimore and Washington. Uh, we usually right. are in like Silver Spring, uh, so this year we're in Baltimore. Uh, we were at the business center a couple of years ago. It's really nice.